This is CBC Here and Now. Do you have an unused prepaid cash card? Surprise, you may have the card, but not the cash. We are underdiagnosed. A new report says women are dying unnecessarily from heart disease. It is unusual. Orcas mimicking human words. Can they really communicate with us? Here we go again. Rainfall warnings are in effect for the south coast of the island with a big warm up coming for all of Newfoundland tomorrow. Special weather statements and more snow on the way for Labrador. The details are coming up. Our top story now, a cash card that has no value. That is the hard reality some consumers are confronted with. Those prepaid cash cards poked away in purses and wallets are worthless. Here now is Martin Jones found out the hard way that cash cards are very different than gift cards. So I've had a prepaid cash card in my wallet since 2016. When I tried using it recently, all my money was gone. Turns out the type of card you have could decide how much money you actually have to spend. Gift cards and prepaid cash cards are different, and the rules they follow are different too. A gift card can be used at a specific store or shopping mall. They're protected by legislation and often have no fees or expiration dates. A prepaid cash card, like Visa or MasterCard, can be used anywhere that accepts credit cards. They are not included under that legislation. Prepaid Visa and MasterCards uh, fall outside that legislation. So A, they are allowed to expire, uh, and they also are allowed to uh, incur fees. The issuing company will charge a fee that will ultimately, over time, uh, deplete the balance until it reaches zero, and, uh, and that card is essentially not, uh, not worth anything anymore. Once the card is activated, you've got a grace period, usually about 12 months before those fees and those charges kick in, and that's whether you use the card or not. And that's exactly where my money went. Representatives for Visa and MasterCard both declined to do an interview, but added that just because their logo was on the card doesn't mean they decide its fees or rules. That's left up to the financial institution that issued it. So that leaves us with the fine print. There's nothing really hidden here. Each card has its own specific rules and regulations and fees associated with it. You can find it all in the card packaging or right on the card itself. The problem is, we actually have to read it. So if you're like me and saving one of these for a rainy day, you'll want to read the fine print and probably treat yourself to something special sooner rather than later. Martin Jones, CBC News, Gander. To Labrador now, where a very large and costly security operation took place last summer. CBC News has obtained documents that show just how concerned government officials were about the threat of protests as massive transformers moved from Cartwright to Muskrat Falls. Emergency measures that were brought in, including support from the military. Here now is Terry Roberts has this exclusive report now on what the RCMP dubbed Project Beltway. Things got ugly at the Muskrat Falls site in the fall of 2016. Court injunctions, arrests, hunger strikes, and a significant delay in construction activity. The backdrop? Nalcor was preparing to transport giant transformers across Labrador the next summer. With the threat of more protests, alarm bells were going off at the highest levels, reaching all the way to Ottawa. It's spelled out in letters to the military and the federal government from Justice Minister Andrew Parsons. A month later, the Justice Minister invoked emergency measures, granting the RCMP authority to deploy resources to the extent necessary to maintain law and order. And that's just what the RCMP did. Officers and equipment from across Newfoundland and Atlantic Canada went to Labrador. From a low of 80 to a high of 135 officers were there between June and September. That and other factors resulted in a steep drop in the number of speeding tickets and other traffic violations on our roads. Why so many officers? Police say to enforce court injunctions against protesters and because of Labrador's vast geography. The seven transformers were traveled from Cartwright to Muskrat Falls, 400 kilometers. With limited services to support such a large security force, cue the military. In this letter to the then commander of Joint Task Force Atlantic, Andrew Parsons requests that the military provide operational assistance to the RCMP in the form of meals and accommodations. The military agrees to do so at Five Wing Goose Bay, but with strict limitations on their role. 
CAF members will not engage in assistance to RCMP activities of an operational nature. This includes any manner of forcible control of the civilian population by CAF personnel, use of CAF facilities or equipment to detain any individual placed under arrest, and providing transportation to and from operational policing activities. An important but low-key role, ensuring clashes like this would not occur. The Oka crisis in Quebec, a well-publicized and violent conflict between First Nations and the Canadian government in 1990. Soldiers on the front line. The RCMP's top officer in St. John's agreed to talk with the CBC this week, but refused an on-camera interview. We didn't want to uh, find ourselves uh, putting an unreasonable pressure on existing uh, infrastructure, and we wanted to make sure that our people were given uh, healthy and safe accommodation. Uh, and the way to do that was to simply reach out to our uh, Canadian Forces uh, partners. The first transformer left Cartwright on July 26th. A month later, the final one rolled through the gates at Muskrat Falls. Mission complete and mostly uneventful. So was all the security necessary? It's very difficult to decide uh, if the resource allocations were correct because at the end of the day it was a relatively uneventful event. So, you know, was that because there were police officers there with a detailed plan and uh, strategy? Or um, would it have been uneventful anyhow? The Canadian Forces told me it's not uncommon for them to provide a supporting role to provincial and federal agencies. And a spokesperson repeatedly stressed the limited nature of that support in this case. Meanwhile, the bills are still being compiled for Project Beltway. Earlier estimates put the cost at $10 million, but Peter Clark expects the final price tag will be slightly lower. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. Well, taps have run dry again in Howley four days after the town's water first stopped flowing. There have been several setbacks in trying to get the water running again from the supply in Sandy Lake to the town's pump house. A temporary hose was working for several hours on Tuesday, but it became blocked. Then yesterday, the town finally got one of the two main pumps working again, but that pump failed overnight. The town is now into its fourth day of a state of emergency. The town says the next step is to turn the to the provincial government for help. So before we get to the weather, Ryan. Um... I was just looking at how cold it was in Howley, those uh, poor workers there on the ice. Uh, yeah. Pretty cold there. Yeah, very, Definitely. very bitter. Here, wasn't awfully cold, although I felt today there was a bit of a chill. And it was, a little, again, messy getting around a bit this morning. Oh, you're not going to yeah. tell everybody how you came in and heckled me about how cold it was this <laughs> afternoon when you were out. And I said, it's only minus one, Anthony. Uh, but it was bitter with that wind chill for sure. I'm sorry, I had to rat you out. I had a feeling that was going to happen. Yeah, that's right. And it's that damp cold. It's too. true. Yeah. It's true. Okay. She's uh, on my side, you're not. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Now, there is a warm-up on the way, uh, another one, which is hard to believe, and that's where we're going to start this evening. Rainfall warnings are in effect for Conegra, Bergiotoramia, and across to Port of Basque, where we're talking about 30 to 60 millimeters on the way for that southwest coast. Here's a look at the latest Canadian forecast model run. Everybody going to be seeing rain up towards Cornerbrook and Howley. Uh, some beneficial rain, hard to believe we're talking about that in February, but that is the case. Uh, by the time we get to Saturday morning, Model projections here in that 10 to 20 millimeter range, maybe a little bit more. Uh, that is also the case across to the southeast. It's that southwest coast where anything you see in red here from Port of Basque across to Conegra has the potential to see uh, over 50 millimeters based on the latest forecast model runs. This is in pretty good agreement with uh, some of the other runs we're seeing. And again, some max totals here, possibly over 60 or 70 millimeters uh, for Bergio to Ramia. Special weather statements are in effect for Happy Valley Goose Bay, Makovic, south to the Straits. There is more snow on the way here. Happy Valley Goose Bay, the snow is really adding up there. 180 centimeters on the ground right now. We'll talk more about that coming up in a couple of minutes with your full forecast details. Debbie? Thanks, Ryan. Well, our health care system may be failing female heart patients. That's according to some startling statistics in a new report from the Heart and Stroke Foundation. And it's research that's close to one local woman's heart. Jen White has that story. Women living with cardiovascular disease are undertreated, underdiagnosed. April Manuel is a nurse and researcher who studies women's cardiac health. She's pleased Heart and Stroke's report is raising awareness. The report, called Ms. Understood, has some shocking statistics. 
In Canada, a woman dies of heart disease every 20 minutes. Women are five times more likely to die from heart disease than breast cancer. Early signs of an impending heart attack were missed in 78% of women. And two-thirds of heart disease clinical research still focuses on men. Manuel says it's now known that women's hearts are physiologically different from men's, so they experience heart disease differently. Men classically have what we call, uh, I call, the Hollywood syndrome, in that they'll have sh extremely short of breath, they'll be clutching their chest, they'll be extremely diaphoretic and say, I have this amazing pressure or pain in my chest. Whereas women have more subtle signs, they have this uh, fatigue, they would describe a pressure on their chests. They may have some nausea. The report also states Indigenous women and women living in rural areas are vulnerable due to the lack of resources for cardiac care. Manuel grew up in the small Newfoundland town of Charleston, and she's the only one in her family without any signs or symptoms of heart disease. Women in Newfoundland have a higher, uh, higher weight. Our BMIs are higher. Uh, we do not eat healthy fruits and vegetables. You know, we do not exercise the recommended level of physical activity. So, you know, we have a role as women to get out and start doing these things. Manuel says it's important for women to share their experiences and stories about heart disease, both with their healthcare professionals and other women, because she says education and awareness are key for healthy hearts. Jen White, CBC News, St. John's. It's interesting, Debbie, because we really do tend to think of heart attacks, or at least men do, as a, as a men's health problem. Yeah, right? and obviously this is very good uh, report to shine a light on, on uh, the women. Yeah, and their a very serious issue. Yeah. The privacy commissioner says he doesn't have enough evidence to say the town of Paradise deliberately destroyed data, but there's one man who doesn't buy that. You'll be meeting him very soon.
Welcome back. A Paradise man who ran for mayor still has many questions about why information that he asked for was destroyed. This despite the damning findings of the province's privacy commissioner over the wiping out of election records. Donovan Malloy describes the town of Paradise's actions as careless at best, and he goes further, saying the town's destruction of requested surveillance video was grossly negligent. To get more on this story, I met up with John Roberts late this afternoon. Were you satisfied with what the Privacy Commissioner found? No, I was not. Uh, I think the Privacy Commissioner could have went a little bit further and brought in the Municipal Affairs to do an investigation and find out the true findings of what happened. All right, now you ran for mayor, uh, you didn't win. You asked to see the election tallies. What happened? Uh, I wasn't given them. I was told I had to sign a, a Freedom of Information Request form. I filled it out uh, with the assistance of someone with uh, Municipal Affairs. And at that time, they said they can never be destroyed. So I filled it out. And up on the 26th of October, while the strike was ongoing, I received an email saying that it was destroyed all the information. Right, so everything was deleted as far as the voting records go? As far as I know, anything to do with the election is gone. All right. The other thing you wanted, you wanted the surveillance video for some, what was the surveillance video you wanted? I was called uh, during the election and I was told that uh, the mayor or the other candidate for mayor at the time uh, was campaigning, shaking hands or what have you at the Double Ice Complex. I just wanted to see it for myself. And, when and that's, I asked, where, that's where the votes were, were happening? That's right? where the election was happening. You can go up there and vote. Uh, at that time, I just wanted to see, you know, see what happened. And I asked for it and, again, gone, destroyed. All right, so the election tallies were deleted. The video you wanted was deleted. The uh, privacy commissioner said this was incompetence, basically. This was negligence, but there wasn't enough evidence to say this was intentional. What do you think? Do you buy that? No. Where there's smoke, there's fire, okay? That... I have no idea what happened. When you run for an election, you hope there's some transparency there and reasonable to believe that they know what they're doing. So no, I didn't uh, believe that uh, this is not intentional or what have you. I think it was. I think it was destroyed. He beat me 80 to 20. Right. That gives him bragging rights. Why not show them to me? I just wanted to see the tally sheets from each polling station so I can adjust just in case I ever wanted to run again. Right. No more than that. Yeah. So now you're kind of suspicious about the result. It's not suspicious about the results. Right now, they can't say I lost or I won or I didn't do anything. And there was a lot of people that ran in this past election that had the same feeling. Mm -hmm. This is the only council in all of Newfoundland that the exact same council went back in with no question. Last question for you. Look back there, Town of Paradise. They say they're going to change the way they manage their data and records. Do you, do you sleep better at night now? No, because I still feel that someone should be held accountable and responsible for what happened. It's fine to say for Malloy that something has to be done. The privacy someone commissioner. Someone has to be accountable. Bar none, someone has to be accountable. I'm not going to be happy until Municipal Affairs walks in there and does a full-blown investigation and a forensic audit on the town of Paradise for everything that's happened now and this past summer with everything that was ongoing. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, Anthony, yeah. what's the town saying? Well, because of the Privacy Commissioner's report, Debbie, uh, the town says that it is reviewing the way uh, it handles uh, the access to information re requests when people are trying to find some information. So they're at least reviewing what happened. Still kind of curious, though. Coming up, meet a gentle giant <laughs> named Charlie and her unlikely best friend, this hen.
This weather forecast has been brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. 5,000 kilometers of groomed trails are waiting to be explored. Embrace winter today. So Ryan, just hold your weather thoughts because we have a little bit of video of an unlikely pair of pals in Conception Bay South. It's Charlie the Rottweiler and her boss, Penny. Get that old bird, Charlie. Get that bird. They're awesome friends, best of friends. Yeah, they've been friends for quite a while. Charlie's had uh, quite a few chicken friends over the years, so she's really good. She's only two, but she's, uh, she's really good around all animals. Penny's the boss in the shop. Yeah, Charlie doesn't uh, doesn't like to be pecked in the face, and Penny has a tendency to peck Charlie in the face, so she's a bit of a suck like that. So a six pound bird is fully around 130 pound dog, pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> they do quite often, actually. Every probably two or three times a week. Yeah, but usually when it's slow, when I'm I'm doing something else and they're kind of bored, they'll find time to occupy themselves. She lays an egg a day somewhere in my shop usually, so it's like. Uh, an Easter egg hunt every day trying to find the egg. And does Charlie ever find the eggs? Uh, sometimes, yeah. Charlie will bring them back to me actually if she finds them. Oh, she won't eat them? No, no, she doesn't even, she won't even break them. Penny's the boss, she's the store manager. And our Mark Quinn uh, dropped by there to pick that uh, footage up for us. So there you go. Why did the chicken cross the Rottweiler? <laughs> 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 Yeah, the nice. Charlie seems pretty gentle. Yeah, you know, I think given so. Given that annoying bird. Yeah, that's right. That keeps pecking the pup in the face. So yeah, I wouldn't. If I was that bird, I wouldn't be turning my back on Charlie no, for uh, for too long. That's right. You never know. Uh, okay, so welcome to February. Happy February, everybody. Uh, this is a month, of course, the shortest month, but despite how short it is, we gain quite a bit of daylight, and uh, that's one of the themes that I'm looking at as we hit this halfway point of winter, is the longer days. Yay. Not necessarily we'll be seeing sun on all of these days, but if you, again, pick out your location, St. John's will gain one hour and 26 minutes this month. Our sunrise this morning was at 727. By the end of the month, our sunrise will be at 643. Our sunset tonight at 503. It won't set till 545 a month from now. And how about Labrador really picking up uh, the light right now at an hour and 45 minutes generally from Happy Valley Goose Bay across to uh, Labrador City. So some uh, positive thoughts there. Also, another thing to... Uh, point out is if you look at the averages of temperatures over the last 30 years, well this week is when temperatures generally bottom out. The trend is upward and the road to spring begins after we kind of bottom out this week in terms of again those 30 year average temperatures. Every year is different but uh, a couple of things that if you're not a huge fan of winter well uh, this halfway point is uh, perhaps a little bit of something that you can look towards the end of the light of the tunnel. If you love winter well you've got half left so you're still good. Now of course if you're on the island you're saying what winter and again another warm up. Look at these temperatures three four five degrees across uh, the Maritimes right now. That is the warm air that is trucking into our neck of the woods right now and uh, again still waiting for that warmth. Uh, are still waiting for that cold air to kind of sit around and stay for the island and not seeing any of that in the next little bit. Now, as we take a look at the uh, satellite and radar picture, we're seeing a couple of flurries edging up towards the southwest part of the island right now. Some showers again pushing over the Maritimes. And here is how things will play it with your future tracker. It's very light flurry action, not really much in the way of accumulation. Some showers before morning for most of central and eastern Newfoundland. Fog is going to be an issue for your drive tomorrow morning as uh, the fog and drizzle and the winds in from the south gusting 60 to 70 kilometers per hour. So keep that in mind, especially across eastern and southern Newfoundland. Some wet flurries even mixing in tomorrow morning for Cornerbrook and especially up towards the northern peninsula. Labrador is uh, pretty quiet to start the day, but we will see some of that snow tracking in as we roll through the Friday afternoon time period and into Friday evening. Hence those special weather statements in effect there. Could see 10 to as much as even 15 centimeters over the southeast. Happy Valley Goose Bay likely in that 10 centimeter range as well. Now watch your timeline here. We will see rain again through the day along the west coast of the island for Cornerbrook and South. Gross more and up towards Bay Vert to uh, the higher elevations. We'll still likely see a few wet flakes mixing in through the morning hours before a change over to the afternoon. The temps are warm for sure. Warm relative term, of course, but for February they're warm. Four to seven degrees across most of the island and up into southeastern Labrador. Again, temperatures will be edging close to the freezing mark and you can see in 
lab west, the cold air really filtering back down as winds shift to the northwest. Watch your timeline here. The rain will push across the island through Friday night. Some gusty winds in the 80 90 kilometer per hour range by Saturday morning. We're back to a burst of flurries, maybe enough to coat the grass as we roll into the Saturday afternoon time period. It's gone. Saturday, certainly a breezy day, and these temperatures are your highs. We will be falling into the minus double digits along the west coast, northern peninsula, southeastern Labrador, and falling uh, into the minus 7, even 8 range by the end of Saturday here across central and eastern parts of Newfoundland, minus 30 in Labrador City. And we're going to be pretty quiet for Sunday. Still a chance of seeing some flurries in the mix. Temperatures in the minus 3 to minus 7 range on the island and pretty cold again through Labrador, minus teens and 20s for highs on Sunday. Next week, two systems we're watching, and guess what? More snow and rain in the mix. We'll talk about that coming up. Debbie and Anthony. Thanks again, Ryan. Well, let's take a look at the latest curling results from the Scotties Tournament of Hearts. Today's action was a real nail-biter between Stacy Curtis's team and Team Newfoundland Labrador versus Ontario. The game was a tiebreaker to see which team would advance to the finals. Well, the lead went back and forth from end to end, but in the end, it was a huge disappointment for Curtis and her teammates. Despite this valiant attempt, Newfoundland wasn't able to rebound after Ontario scored three points in the eighth and then two in the ninth. Ontario won 11-8. Now, of course, the loss means Newfoundland is out of the competition. Yeah, Too was bad. sad. I'll bet you most offices around Newfoundland Labrador were like ours today, where everyone's sort of trying to do their job and keeping an eye on the curling at the exactly. same time. Exactly, but anyway, there's always next year, as yeah. they say. They're a young team, and and they obviously have the ability, as they showed in Great the beginning match. of the tournament. Great match, and Ontario, of course, always a powerhouse. But there is a silver lining to Ontario's victory. One member of their team is actually from this province. Yes, Cornerbrook curler Stephanie LeDrew moved to Ontario seven years ago and is now a member of the Sarnia Curling Club. She has an impressive curling resume, including two previous Scotties wins and some world championship medals with Rachel Holman. So congratulations to Stephanie LeDrew. And one last note on curling, of course. It's uh, the men's tankards in St. John's. Team Smith is leading the pack with five wins, no losses. Team Boland and Team Simmons are both four and one. Pretty tight at the top. Mm -hmm. The championship action, that all continues tonight. Well, to another uh, female athlete originally from this province who's also at the top of her game, that's figure skater Caitlin Osmond. Yeah, originally from Marystown, and she's getting ready along with the rest of Canada's Olympic figure skating team to head to South Korea. Here's Caitlin speaking about her previous Olympics experience and the one she's about to embark upon. I never watched the Olympics growing up, so when I showed up at the Olympics, I had no idea what to expect. But it was so exciting seeing so many other athletes from different sports, being able to compete and be on the, the, the team event team. <laughs> and making that podium, it was just absolutely incredible. I'm definitely excited, but I'm more excited for the lead up to Pyeongchang. I'm excited to compete throughout the year. I'm excited to show that I've worked really, really hard. I remember watching the 2010 Olympics for the very first time watching Olympics and saying I was never going to be at that level and by the next Olympics I was competing there and I was standing on a podium and since then it's just been one thing after another, another national title, a world medal and still none of it feels real. <laughs> I still think I'm watching the 2010 Olympics. <laughs> I just want to thank everyone the most because I would never have gotten back on the ice without the support and I never would have continued competing without knowing that I had people to compete for and I just want to say thanks for getting me back to where I can be. Well, with legalization just months away, the federal government is talking about how it wants to deal with issues around drug-impaired driving. Public Safety Minister Ralph Goodale was at a Senate committee to talk about the Liberals' enforcement plans. Our senior parliamentary reporter, Julie Van Dusen, was there, and she joins us now live from Ottawa with more. So, Julie, the focus today was on enforcement and not the actual marijuana legislation bill? No, that's a separate bill, Anthony, and that hasn't gone to a Senate uh, committee yet, but C-46 which gives uh, the government the, the tools or the police 
to uh, stop you at the wheel of is before committee, and that's what's being studied. And Ralph Goodale said today the the big message is they don't want you uh, drinking, uh, driving drunk, and they don't want you driving high. Uh, so C46 comes with penalties, that's for sure, from a fine all the way to jail time, depending on the circumstances of uh, what you've been involved with. And it's all about testing at the wheel. So uh, the police can stop you once this bill is passed <clears throat> and basically give you a roadside breathalyzer test. They don't need a reason to see if you're drunk. Or they can give you a saliva test to see if you've been smoking dope. And uh, so there was some concern that some of this equipment wouldn't work, but they've tested it in six cities and they say it does. Uh, the committee had concerns today from some of the senators that the police may not be ready, but the police says um, everything's a go. So take a listen to the RCMP, followed by Ralph Goodell. Thanks a lot. Take care. Uh, would additional time be beneficial? Always. Uh, more time is always beneficial to provide police time to train and to, and to plan. That's what we do. But given the amount of time that we have, we will be prepared with the resources that we have to be able to respond. The risk of impairment the risk that you are putting yourselves and your passengers and other people on the road uh, in, uh, in, in mortal peril is just too high. Do not smoke high, period. All right, Julie, as you know, there's a constituency across the country that's looking forward to legalization. When is this bill going to be passed? Well, they want it passed as soon as possible because legalization is supposed to happen in July. Uh, but in the meantime, they're coming out with a big advertising campaign of about $3 million. You're going to see lots of ads in bars, on social media, on Facebook, uh, with that message that Ralph Goodale had really is uh, don't drive high. So expect to see those soon. All right, Julie, appreciate that. That's Julie Van Dusen, a senior reporter at CBC's Parliamentary Bureau in Ottawa this evening. Hello? Amy. Orcas imitating human words? Well, our national science reporter on talking to these animals. Cousins come together for the 41st Evans Family Reunion on the point precious to the family that first settled it. Sunday at noon and Monday at 7.
orcas have long fascinated people. They're intelligent, sophisticated hunters with complex vocalizations, much like their dolphin cousins. But killer whales imitating human voices? Well, that's what a new study out of the UK claims. Hello. Wiki is a 14-year-old orca at a marine land aquarium in France. She reportedly imitated several words, including hello and Amy. Here's Wiki apparently repeating words spoken by her trainer. Hello. Amy. One, two, three. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bob McDonald is a science reporter and the host of CBC Radio's Quirks and Quarks, and we've reached him in Victoria, B.C. Thanks so much for joining us, Bob. My pleasure, Debbie. So what do you make of this study? Was that whale really imitating those words? Well, it was imitating sounds. I don't believe it was talking. It reminds me of the guy who says, hey, my dog can talk. And it says to the dog, what's on the side of a tree? And the dog goes, bark. <laughs> oh. <and ruff." laughs> you know? So it's, it's imitating sound. But I, I don't think they were actually speaking or understanding what they were saying. But they were communicating with humans. And they were imitating, which is what the whales do in the wild. So it's part of their natural behavior. But I haven't heard, though, of a whale actually imitating human words before. Uh, I know other animals have done this, like parrots and so on, but this is rather unusual, isn't it? It is unusual, but it's, uh, it's, they do communicate with us uh, because in, in these captive whales, you know, they learn to do tricks and all that. They learn hand signals. They learn body position and, and how to, what, what the people want and how they respond to that and back and forth. Uh, I've spoken with people at marinas who uh, have talked, work with killer whales and they say, you know, they have moods. Some days they're in bad moods. They don't want to do the tricks and we got to work them up or sometimes you got to stay away from them. So they express emotions just like we do. And, and when you think about it, you know, they're mammals like we are. In fact, they have brains that are larger than ours, not just absolute size, but compared to their body. Their brains are bigger than ours compared to our body. So they have very complex communication that they do in the wild. And I think this is just, just part of it. And in fact, scientists use their vocalizations to actually identify them out here. I live on the West Coast and I'm a sailor and I see orca all the time, both on my boat and I've, I've been to a number of, of uh, aquariums and seen them in captivity. And they have different ways of communicating. They, they click just, just to understand distance. They use it like sonar to find food, to see where each other is. But they, those squeals and, and whistles that they make are actual communications that the mothers teach the children. And they have family groups. And what they have found out here, scientists on the West Coast have found that family groups have dialects that they'll say their sounds a little differently from another group. And there are clans. There are clans of families that communicate with each other. And the scientists are actually using these to see who's identified with who, who's related to who, when they just see a fin swimming by. They can listen with hydrophones and say, oh, that's, uh, that's related to this one over there. So they really do have complicated communication. Yeah, much like dolphins that have been studied many years now. Um, getting back to the study out of the UK, though, is there any possibility in orca, as you've said, such an intelligent animal, that huge brain, could they actually be taught to understand our language? Well, we, we don't know how much they understand. I mean, dogs understand a lot when you talk to them, but uh, I, I think there's understanding, but then talking back is another issue. Uh, maybe we should be learning whale, but they don't have the same vocal mechanism we do, so don't expect them to start speaking English. We don't even know among themselves what they talk about, whether it's just, hey, I'm me, and I'm your mother, or I'm your sister, or I'm your daughter, whatever, or whether they're talking philosophy. And it's, I think it's important for us to understand animal communication if, if we're going to understand them and their habitat and our impact on them. If we could communicate with them, it would be great. The more we communicate with them, uh, the better. But they're not going to be speaking English back. I don't believe that. <laughs> Bob McDonald, thanks very much for joining us. Hey, Debbie.
Such beautiful animals. Oh, they're Very magnificent. Gorgeous. I'm so fascinated with all that communication mm -hmm. between uh, those animals. And uh, I did study a bit of it when I was in university. Really? Dolphin Test communication. Your whale. <laughs> and I just find it fascinating. <laughs> it is fascinating. I think if they could talk, they'd say, get me out of this tank. It looks so beautiful <laughs> out in the wild. This is a huge step for us. A Nova Scotia laboratory is one step closer to creating a test for Alzheimer's disease. Time now to introduce our Young Athlete of the Day. This is four-year-old Spencer Hayward of Puchko. Spencer started his first year of hockey this fall with the Northeast Eagles Minor Hockey Associ Association. It's uh, quite the cage uh, on <laughs> Spencer's head. Spencer's also played two seasons with Timbit Soccer and also attends weekly swimming lessons. Great work, Spencer. You're today's Young Athlete of the Day. The weather update is brought to you by Bell Tone Hearing Service St. John's, helping the world hear better. So I'm getting punished on social media for complaining to Ryan Snodden that it was really cold and it turned out to only be what, minus one, minus which one. you exposed. Yeah. 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 But it was a cold minus one. Yeah. It was it was a damp minus one. And you folks in Happy Valley Goose Bay, you should hear him complaining about his driveway <laughs> shoveling because uh, when you see this picture, I mean, there must be some sore backs. Now, I know a lot of people have snowblowers yeah. in Happy Valley Goose they Bay. They need them there. Still. And they need them because if you... Oh, my. If you know someone who doesn't have a snowblower... Please help a friend. Wow. This picture was taken today uh, or maybe late yesterday, and Annette and Dale Michelin say, enough is enough. Right. Snow is piling up. So I did some digging. There was <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> so to speak. But yeah. And you found out that Dale's only four foot two. <laughs> Uh, well, again, and this the measurement comes from the airport, so Dale, I'm not actually uh, measuring you here on the air, but at the airport there was 180 centimeters of snow on the ground. So that's about five foot nine. Yeah. And that is the most snow to start the month of February since 1980. Wow. And 1980 is the record setting year, basically. Uh, there was a big snow year in 78 and again in 1980, and those are the years that this year we'll be chasing in terms of the record books. 
actually only about a foot shy of uh, what is the record, which is 202 and 206 centimeters for February it and must for March. Have, must have taken them ages just to get that gate open. Yeah. <laughs> wow. A lot of digging. All right, I won't complain anymore, Ryan, I promise. <laughs> You can complain to me all you want. Just don't <laughs> complain to the folks in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Okay. Uh, especially given what I'm about to say, and that is that there's more snow on the way for Happy Valley Goose Bay. We already have a special weather statement in effect uh, with this next system moving in, and there's two more waiting in the wings as we roll into next week. Uh, this has really been the setup over the last, well, month, six weeks, even two months. The cold air sitting in place in Labrador with the snow and the warm air that keeps moving into Newfoundland and changing the snow over to rain. Special weather statements are in effect for Happy Valley Goose Bay, McCovic and down towards the southeast. Where we could see some totals in that 10 to 15 centimeter range. The rainfall warnings, in case you missed it earlier, want to recap that. Port of to Conegra, 30 to 60 millimeters. And it looks like the Buren Peninsula not into the rainfall warning, though 20 to 30 millimeters looking not out of the question there by the time we get to Saturday morning. But again, the 50 plus totals looking best uh, possibilities there from Conegra back towards Port of Basque. In terms of your timing and how things play out, quick little wave tonight, light snow over to some showers. Drizzle lingering for Friday morning. Fog patches are really going to be uh, an issue for the drive tomorrow morning. Expect fog and drizzle. Uh, steadier rain works into the afternoon for western Newfoundland. Even the northern peninsula will see snow mixing over to rain. There's that snow really ramping up. Happy Valley Goose Bay, but more so for the southeast. And then that rain will walk across the island from west to east for by the time we get to Saturday morning. That's where we'll see our transition through Saturday morning to some rain over to a quick little burst of snow, maybe enough to whiten the grass. A couple of centimeters not out of the question on the back side of that cold front. And for the uh, west coast, some onshore flurries that will linger into Saturday. Sunday's pretty quiet to start, but our next system will move in as we work into the Sunday afternoon time period. This is the long range outlook. One model, but I got to say for a long range, both of the uh, long range forecast models, the two of the best anyway, the American and European are both in pretty good agreement here that we see snow moving in on uh, Sunday night. It's a mix over to snow from snow to rain for the island on Monday. More snow for Labrador, sorry. Uh, as we roll into the Tuesday time period, we've got onshore flurries. Then watch our next system, the same track farther west, snow for Labrador, rain for the island. And in fact, that Thursday forecast could see at this point anyway models flirting with some double digit possibilities again and that is well into february so there is uh, what you see basically february picking up where january left off which is a roller coaster ride of temperatures we're above zero we're below zero we're above zero we're below zero and above again across most of newfoundland as we roll over the next seven days central Western Newfoundland also in the, to those warm ups uh, for early next week and mid to late next week. So we'll be keeping a close eye on that situation uh, for Happy Valley, the Goose Bay, Labrador City, more snow and more cold in the forecast. And again, for Goose Bay chasing down those records Monday and Thursday, we'll see snow. Debbie and Anthony. Appreciate that, Ryan. In national and international news tonight, NDP Member of Parliament Aaron Weir has been suspended from caucus duties after an allegation of harassment against female staffers. Leader Jagmeet Singh says Weir's status in the party will be evaluated after an independent investigation. We just have a concern that's been raised by one of our members. The concern is serious enough for me to take action, and that's why I'm taking action at this point. Singh had no details, but said the accusation did not point to harassment of a sexual nature. It came in an email from another member of parliament. No one claiming to be a victim has come forward. Weir was elected in a Regina riding in 2015 and was previously a senior NDP advisor. In a statement, he says he does not know what is being alleged, and he says he's confident that he has not harassed anyone. An 18-year-old Quebec man is in hospital with severe head wounds after he was shot by a special constable in a provincial courthouse. The incident was caught on video yesterday by a witness. A caution to viewers, you may find the sounds and images disturbing. 
It happened during an altercation between the young man and the special constable in Maniwaki, north of Ottawa. Investigators say the teen grabbed the constable's baton and hit him with it. The shot was fired soon after. The teen is reported to be in stable condition. Quebec's independent police watchdog is investigating. Researchers around the world are determined to find better ways to diagnose and treat Alzheimer's. It's a disease that will affect more and more people each year as the population ages. At one lab in Nova Scotia, they're working on identifying Alzheimer's earlier. Colleen Jones reports. These are all of the brain tissues that we store and look after. For the last 20 years, Dr. Sultan Darvish has been collecting brains. We started this brain bank over 20 years ago. And we have been able to archive and collect over 1,100 uh, brain tissues. And, you know, we use them for our research. There haven't been many breakthroughs in the treatment for Alzheimer's disease, partly because they can only diagnose the disease by examining the brain after death. This one is a healthy one where my thumb is. In my right hand, I'm holding uh, uh, an Alzheimer brain. But Dr. Darvish and his research team have discovered compounds that, at least in mice, are able to diagnose the disease. This is a eureka moment. This is the MRI scan, so this is normal, and this is Alzheimer's mouse. When we inject our compound into the normal mouse, you can see there's very little radioactivity in the brain. But when we inject into the animal model with Alzheimer's disease, there is a lot of retention of this in the brain. And this is a huge step for us. They'll present their findings at the Global Alzheimer's Conference in Chicago in July, where the world's brightest minds are looking to solve the Alzheimer's riddle. The next step, a safe test for humans. But we are hoping that, uh, you know, in the next three to five years, we'll be in a position to apply for permission to take this into human trials. Being able to test for Alzheimer's while the person's alive opens new doors. If you can definitively diagnose Alzheimer's early uh, in, in the human brain. Um, the therapies that uh, are used, that, that are being developed currently, uh, could be more effectively tested. And in a disease that affects so many people, this success brings hope. Colleen Jones, CBC News, Halifax. Well, from Alzheimer's tests to brain tests, or I should say DNA tests, you've probably seen the ads on television from companies that offer to test your DNA. But have you actually read the fine print before following through on those tests? A Halifax privacy lawyer warns the results of those tests could have an impact that extends deep into your family tree. Yvonne Colbert has more. Ancestry DNA is the biggest testing company, with more than 6 million customers worldwide. The test is as easy as spitting into a vial, but it can result in surprises. I got a match that said that this lady was either my first cousin or closer. And I said to my husband, well, how can you be any closer than a first cousin? And then it started to sink in, oh, a sibling. Most of the DNA testing companies provide you with a list of relatives, DNA matches, who've tested on their site. They warn potential users that test results may provide unwelcome or unexpected news, including family secrets or relatives the family never knew existed. 23andMe, which does genetic testing, warns testers results could alter your life. On top of that, some companies also collect personal information about you. If you access them through Facebook or other social media, they may collect your friends and followers, your computer IP address, the service provider, and much more. They disclose all of this in their privacy and cookie policies and their terms and conditions. However, few people read them. It has become one of those things that is almost as casual or potentially as casual as other things we do on the Internet. And a huge number of people just kind of click, I agree, and they, and they continue. They don't necessarily think about this. But they really should think about the fact uh, that this is some of the most sensitive information that exists. Fraser points out it's not just about you, but your family members as well. He advises people to read the policies of each company and choose the one that best suits them. Yvonne Colbert, CBC News, Halifax. There is so much happening in this picture. Uh, hard to believe that it was taken last week. Hmm. So don't let the sand fool you. This is a beautiful spot in Newfoundland. I 
don't want to give it away and I feel like I will if I say exactly where it is, but it's uh, in the western half of the island. How's oh. that? Western half. That western is... half, yes. Mm. And we'll reveal where and what else you should be spotting in the picture after the break. Is the Port of Port Tourism Association paying you to promote that particular area? <laughs> Not on the Port of Port. <laughs> oh. Good guess though. Welcome back. Well, Winterlude kicks off tomorrow in Ottawa, something that you experienced oh, yes. in Ottawa. Very big deal. Preparations are underway, and these carvers are turning Confederation Park into the Crystal Garden. <laughs> Artists from around the world will transform big blocks of ice into frozen works of art. It's, it's one, one of Winterland, uh, Winterlude's biggest attractions. My yeah. wife went to university in Ottawa. I was there numerous times. It's such a great yeah. event. It's so nice. Uh, so uh, great to see that's back on. Okay, if you guessed Bergio, you guessed right. And so, as I said, there's a lot going on in this picture. Uh, one of the things I didn't notice was the bear from one sculpture to another, the ice sculptures. How about mm -hmm. the, the bear, which is basically that I see there on the left-hand side, that rock with ice on top of it. Uh, beautiful shot. Just a big old grizzly yes. right there in Bergio. <laughs> Such a nice picture. We're going to leave that there and say good night to you and hope you're back tomorrow. Good night, everyone. <laughs>